Hey everyone, this is Mike and today's video will be a bit longer than the usual but I had a lot of requests to do the complete walkthrough of setting up the DJI Spark and this is what I'm planning to do today. Before we get to the video, let me just say a huge massive thank you to everyone that has watched my videos. Um, one of my past videos just hit 30,000 views and I'm only doing YouTube for less than two months and being able to hit those numbers and grow that quickly just really means a lot to me. So thank you so much. And if you want to support the channel, feel free to browse my drone merchandise. I'll link it in the description. You can check it out. I'll throw a 10% off discount code that you can use. And thank you once again for your support. All right, let's get to the video. Unfortunately, DJI has not made it super easy for the regular user to connect their drone and I found myself looking for help online for a part of the linking process as it was not explained anywhere. So in today's video, I'll do a complete walkthrough of the initial setup process for the Spark so you can avoid messing around for a few hours and get your drone in the air ASAP. When you first open the box of the Spark, this is what you're going to see. The Spark itself with the battery already installed and a set of propellers. You'll also get the charging brick and a cable so you can connect the drone to your computer. If you get the Fly More combo, you'll also get the remote controller, an extra battery, a shoulder bag, four prop guards, a battery hub that will hold up to three batteries, a 16GB micro SD card, and another set of propellers. The biggest advantage of the Fly More combo is that it saves you roughly 150 bucks by giving you some nice extra accessories and especially the remote controller which I highly recommend and in my next video I'll go into more detail about why the remote controller is a must-have for the Spark. Let's examine the Spark first. On the front of the drone you can see the camera and the infrared sensor which is used for avoiding obstacles in front of the aircraft. On the bottom you can see the visual positioning sensors which detect how close the ground is. They are also used for the famous palm landing. There is also the battery which has two rubber flaps which help you remove it from the body of the drone. Underneath the battery you can find the Spark's Wi-Fi network and password which you should use for the initial connection. Those are also visible on the side of the hard case of the drone. The propellers are foldable and detachable. So if you want to remove them, simply press and turn to the side while you're holding the motors. They come off very easy, but you should only remove them if you plan to change the propellers, otherwise they can be folded quickly and you can keep your drone with them on, which is a huge plus if you travel from place to place a lot and you don't want to waste time. Once you have everything unboxed, it's time to charge all the batteries and the remote, if you have one, so you can start the initial linking process. To do so, simply insert the micro USB cable that comes with the drone into the slot of the back of the drone. When you finally have all the components charged and ready to go, you'll need to insert a micro SD card into the card slot which you can find in the back of the drone. Simply insert the card and push until it clicks back into place. Then turn on the aircraft by pressing the power button once shortly then let go and press again for one or two seconds until all the lights are on and the drone powers on and starts blinking. The procedure for turning off the drone is exactly the same. Once you power on the drone, look at your smartphone's settings where you should find the Spark's Wi-Fi network. Connect to it by entering the password which I showed you earlier. Again, it's underneath the battery tray and on the side of the hard case. When you connect to the Wi-Fi network, open the DJI GO 4 app it's free and it's available both for Android and iOS devices, although it's much more stable on iOS devices. So if you have an iPhone or an iPad around you, I advise you to use it over the Android app. After you open the app, you'll most likely have to update to the latest firmware. Do not skip this, even though it's annoying, as most of the firmware updates fix a lot of the bugs and errors from the previous versions. When you're on the latest firmware and you see the bottom left corner when it says connected, you're good to go and you can tap start flight to enter the Sparks interface. You'll see a ton of information as well as different buttons which might be super confusing but don't worry as we'll go through each and every one of them. And first off let's start with the settings button which you can find at the top right corner of the app. 
those three little dots, tap on them and you'll enter into the settings menu. From here, you can customize your drone settings. The first menu is the main controller settings. From here, you can set your current position as the home point. The home point is the location where the drone will go back to if you run out of battery and you need to land. In case that happens, the drone will fly back to this point and it will land safely. This is an automatic setting and the drone will set your home point automatically by using the built-in GPS every time you start flying. Next, there is the return to home at current altitude setting. So whatever altitude that you're flying at, this is where the drone will return home at. This is very useful if you're flying above a large group of trees or just high obstacles. In the next section, you can set the default return to home altitude. This is the altitude where the drone is always going to be at while trying to return to home. If the home point is more than 80 meters away from the drone, the obstacle avoidance will be turned off. Be careful with this, as you might forget you set it to 30 meters and when you try to return to home, you might hit an obstacle on the way and crash. That's why I've set my return to home altitude to 50 meters and I generally avoid using this function as I prefer to fly the drone back myself. And I've heard plenty of horror stories of flyaways or crashes, so use this uh, function carefully. If you're new to flying, I suggest that you give the beginner mode a try. You can activate it from the next setting. Beginner mode slows down the speed of the drone and limits the range to 30 meters around the home point. It acts like a geofence until you get more comfortable with the controls and the speed of the spark. Once again, if you haven't flown a drone before, do yourself a huge favor and turn on this feature, at least for a few flights. The next section is sensors. Here you can see the IMU and the compass. For both of them, there is a calibrate button and this is something that I like to do when I go to a new location and I fly for the first time. The calibration process will take you through a series of instructions which you'll need to follow and then you'll be good to go. The second menu is all about your visual navigation settings. You can switch the obstacle avoidance on or off and if you keep it on, your drone will automatically stop and hover when it detects an obstacle ahead. If you're in return to home mode and you're less than 80 meters away, the drone will automatically go up and over an obstacle in its way, which is really cool. And the help text is also telling you that the obstacle avoidance cameras have 70 degrees horizontal and 54 degrees vertical field of view. And it also tells you that when the ambient light is weak, the 3D sensing system will also work well. That's really cool. Enable backwards flying. Uh, this is usually used when you're tracking an object and you want to have it in frame as it comes towards you. And I want to have this enabled, so I'll keep this on. But if you're not comfortable flying yet, you might want to leave it off, at least in the beginning. The last section from this menu allows you to turn on the advanced gesture control, which the Spark is known for. And by turning this setting on, you'll be able to use palm launch and palm land and palm control. The next setting from the menu is the Wi-Fi settings. Here you can see that which channel your drone is using and you can change your Wi-Fi name and password. Personally, I don't change anything from this menu, but if you need to switch to another channel for your Wi-Fi, this is where you should go. Next, we have the virtual joystick settings. You can choose between three different stick modes, which basically change the controls for your drone. I personally fly on mode two, as it feels the most natural to me, but you can choose whatever you are most comfortable with. On the bottom of the screen, you can change the joystick speed or how fast the drone reacts to your input. I have mine all the way to the right on fast, but if you're going to be in beginner mode, you might want to experiment a bit and maybe slow it down a bit so you get more comfortable. You can always reset the flight speed control settings and start over if you want. In the following menu, there's information about the battery. You can see the voltage, the temperature, how many times you've charged this particular battery, your battery's serial number and the low battery warning percentage. I always use 30% so I can have enough time to go back to my home point and land safely before my drone runs out of juice. Next, we get to the gimbal settings and if you're using the DJI goggles, you can set the gimbal mode to FPV, otherwise just keep it in follow mode. You can also adjust the gimbal roll and pitch 
Use that if you find that the horizontal or the vertical lines in your footage are not perfectly straight. And lastly, we have the general settings. We have the measurement unit. You can choose between imperial and metric. I have mine in metric as I'm based in Europe. Um, next, we have live streaming. So here's where you can live stream to Facebook, YouTube or other platforms. And that's really cool to have. You also have map coordinates for China mainland. Um, I suggest that you leave that off if you're not in China. Next, we have cache during video shooting. What this does is save a version of your footage on your phone in the app. The main footage is still going to be on the Spark, but the video cache will allow you to see the footage right away. And if you want to do a quick edit from the app and share it, this will allow you to do so. You can select how big the cache could get if you want to clear it automatically once it reaches this amount and if you want to record audio with the cache. Then lastly, you have the device name and the about menu, which gives you all the information about your aircraft version, the flight database, the app database, and the flight controller serial number. So now that we went through all of the settings in the menu, it's time to see what we have on the screen. First, the red button that you can see on the right side is the video record button. The button above switches from video to photo mode and when you click on the button, it takes a photo. If you switch back to video, it will take a video. A very cool feature, see this little icon above that. As you tilt your phone, you pan up and down and rotate the gimbal with your phone. You can use this feature if you're using your smartphone to fly the Spark. And I really like it because it's really smooth and very easy to use. If you don't have the remote controller and you want to fly the Spark with your phone, you can bring up the controls on the screen by tapping on the icon with the four arrows in the left corner. Once you do that, you will see the two joysticks in the middle of the screen. If you press and hold the screen for two seconds, you'll see a dot with a blue border around it. That's another way to control the gimbal up and down with your fingers. On the far right side, right below the record button, you can see the camera controls. Here, you can change the settings for the camera. First off, you can see the switch between auto and manual mode for photos. If you go to manual, you'll be able to change the ISO between 100 and 3200, the shutter speed and the exposure compensation value, which you can also play with. The next screen is the camera. Here, you can pick between the different photography shooting modes. You have single shot, you have multiple shots, you have A, B, you have a time shot, a shallow focus shot, and panoramic mode where you can choose between horizontal or vertical panorama. The last screen gives you even more controls for your camera. You can turn on or off the histogram and basically drag it anywhere on the screen. You can display camera on screen display. You have all of the useful information about the camera controls directly on the screen. I like to keep this feature on so I can easily follow my current settings and avoid shooting in different modes by mistake. The white balance setting is next and it gives you a few different modes. So if you're in mixed lighting scenario and you don't want the light constantly changing, you can pick between the modes you have here. The grid is also a pretty cool feature. It displays a grid on your screen so you can keep things in a third. It's great for framing purposes. And when you put the grid and the diagonals, you have a center mark and your image is cut into thirds which works great for bracketing photos and just generally framing the shots better. This menu is also where you can format your SD card and reset all of the camera settings in case you mess them up completely and you want to start fresh. In the bottom right hand corner, you can see the play button where you can see all of the footage you've shot and mark it as favorite if you wish. The dotted lines with the arrows right next to the record button are the gimbal control. You simply click on the up or down arrows to move the gimbal and this is just another way to do it as I've mentioned the previous two methods. So let's move to the top of the screen. On the top you see the flight information and the current mode that you're in. Right now we're indoors so we don't really have any GPS lock so it's just showing the yellow warning text. Once you're outside you will have GPS lock and you will be good to fly and then it will turn green and it will say good to fly. Underneath the yellow text, you can see a small green bar, which is actually your battery level. 
As you fly, it will move to the left and once it reaches the first dot from the line, it means you're at 30%. The second dot is when you hit 10% and at that point, you shouldn't be flying anymore and you should have your drone landed immediately. On the right of the battery level, you can see the number of satellites you're currently connected to, the Wi-Fi strength and the Wi-Fi channel, and lastly, we have the battery level. If you click on it, it goes right into the battery settings where we can see more data. The last few things on the screen are on the left side. The icon on the top with the DJI logo will just take you back to your home screen. Under that, there is the takeoff button and if you tap on it, you will have to slide your finger to the right once the pop-up shows and then the drone will take off. Under the takeoff button, we have the return to home button. This is where you can initiate the return to home function from, which we talked about earlier. And finally, the icon with the controller is where you can find all of your flying modes. You can choose between six different modes. Normal is your normal flying mode that you're into right now. Quick shot is a smart mode which allows you to shoot some great footage with cinematic composition. And once you select quick shot mode, you have to draw a shape around the object you want to follow. It can be a person or any other object. And once you draw a rectangle around the object, you can choose between four different quick shot modes. Rocket will ascend with the camera pointing downwards. Droney will fly backwards and upwards with the camera locked on the subject. Circle will circle around your target. And Helix will fly upwards, spiraling around your subject. The next mode is Active Track. Here, the drone will recognize objects of different shapes and sizes and it will then track them according to what they are and how fast they move. You can track your target from the front or the back or even circle around it or just follow your subject from a fixed perspective. Next, we have Tap Fly. To use it, you simply need to tap your phone screen and the Spark, using vision technology, will fly in the direction of your tap or exactly where you tap while actively sensing obstacles. To be honest, this feature is cool, but I found myself almost never using it, apart from trying it a few times in the beginning, but it's still nice to have. Tripod mode is for extra steady shots, and just like beginner mode, it will limit the speed of the aircraft, but in return, you'll get some super silky smooth and cinematic shots, as the camera and the whole drone are extremely stable, even when there's stronger wind. Lastly, there's gesture mode, where you can use the Spark gesture controls. You can make a frame with your fingers and get your selfie taken, or you can raise your palm and maneuver the drone with your hand movements. All in all, this mode is great to show off in front of your friends um, just a few times, but I don't really use it in my regular flying that often. And there you have it guys. This is everything that you need to know about the initial setup of the DJI Spark. If you're still watching up until this point, thank you so much for your patience. Please like the video and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this one. My next video will be all about the DJI Spark controller and it's coming very soon, so stay tuned. Thank you so much again for watching and I'll catch you guys in my next video. Ciao!